it's time for us to start. It's 12 o'clock. Um, I'll just say I want to thank our special guests for this afternoon who are two genealogy reference assistants in the Robert F. Smith Explore Your Family History Center at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a mouthful. Um, allow me to introduce Lisa Crawley, a native of Elizabeth, New Jersey, whose research interests include antebellum era African American history of the Mid Atlantic and Upper South and Methodist history. Lisa's career experience includes serving as the resource center manager of the of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum in Baltimore and as the administrator of the Montgomery County Historical Society in Rockville. She holds a BA in economics from Drew University and an MA in museum studies from Hampton University. I would also like to introduce Hannah Scruggs, a Central Virginia native who graduated with an MA in public history from North Carolina State University and a BA in history from the College of William and Mary. Her research and professional interests include slavery, descendant communities, and African-American environmental history. Ladies, welcome and thank you both for being here today to guide us all in tracing our family trees. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having us. We're really excited to be here and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can go ahead and get started. All right. All right, so today we're going to talk about tracing our family tree. Um, and it's our introduction to genealogy research We'll talk through the steps to get started and then we'll demonstrate a case study. Um, so we're really glad that you all are here. We are also available for one-on-one um, -on -one individual sessions or small family sessions. So we have our email address at the end and we'll make sure we put it in the chat. If you're interested after the session and working with us, please reach out to us and um, we'll make an appointment with you. So we are the Robert F. Smith Explore Your Family History Center. We're part of the Center for Digitization and Creation of African American History. We have actually worked with the Margaret Walker Center in Jackson State before. In August of 2019, we had the privilege of um, spending some time in the Margaret Walker Center during AAAM, and so we're really excited to be back virtually. Um, but the Family History Center is one of the four components. We also have an internship program um, for African-American museums or collections related to African-American history. Um, we have the professional curation program where we digitize items for, uh, from partner institutions. And then the community curation program, which is sort of our signature event um, where we travel to different cities and digitize different uh, personal collections. People can bring their collections to us. We digitize them and give them back to them on a flash drive. And we also host programming and events while we are in the cities where we're located. So um, we were in Baltimore in 2017. In 2018, we were in Denver. 2019, we were in Chicago. Um, and COVID has made things different for us now, but we're still looking forward to working with people in the cities that we've connected with, as well as forming new connections. We also have a community curation platform um, where it's kind of like Instagram but for family pictures and family stories. So if you are interested in that, please go to communitycuration.org and sign up for an account. That way you can share the family history that you've learned as well as photos and images that you may have. So as we mentioned, we're part of the Robert F. Smith Explore Your Family History Center. That's what we represent, it's our component. Um, this is a picture of the space pre-COVID we did um five to six genealogy sessions a day before the pandemic we did them in group settings um and we worked you know with anywhere from from five to 60 people in a day um now that the pandemic has happened we've become virtual so we've done more presentations like this where we talk about the basics of getting started with genealogy and family history research as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions um, the one-on-one -on -one sessions have been really interesting for us and allowed us to work with different people um, and get to see more uh, a broader 
cross section of African American genealogy. So I think we both have really enjoyed um, that process. And for public programs and exhibits, um, our next public, we host monthly public programs. That's another part of what we do. Um, our next public program is going to be called um, Revisiting the African Burial Ground um, Impact, Impacts on Black Cemeteries. We have Dr. Michael Blakey, Peggy King Yorda, and Dr. Joseph Jones joining us for a conversation on the importance of the African Burial Ground Project and how it's impacted Black cemeteries since then. So it's May 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have a link that we can also put in the chat after our program if you're interested and would like to sign up. They also live forever on our Ustream page, so if you can't make it, you can definitely view it later. Um, we also have Polly Murray's Proud Shoes, a classic in African American genealogy. We did um, an, a small exhibition, as you can see, that's in the Family History Center that opened on February 28th, 2020, um, but we now have an online exhibit that's also available to look around. We can put the the link in the chat for that as well um, so that you can view that. Um, so that's a, an exhibit that we're really excited about. We try to put exhibitions that highlight um, genealogy or resources, genealogy resources in some capacity in this in this exhibit and now we're working on our online, strengthening our online components as well. And so yes, as I mentioned, I will put the link in the chat for that after the program. So we get, like to get started with what is genealogy and family history. Um, they are, they're used interchangeably and they are similar, but we say that genealogy is the tracing the lines of descent and family history is the story, um, the study of the lineage and all of the context and the life stories um, is the, the meat of it, it's the family history and then genealogy helps you get there a lot of times and also helps with asking questions, helps with chronology and helps fill in some of the gaps that maybe we miss from, from the oral history. Some common issues that we have that we face in genealogy is um, the genealogy and the research that we have maybe not matching the oral history. Um, and it doesn't have to be an issue. You can, we can learn how to integrate both of those things into the stories of our families, but that can be something that's a stumbling block at times. Identifying surnames is another one. People's last names have changed, the spellings have changed, and census takers were not always the best at um, being careful with spellings or paying attention to how names are, are, are spelled. So that can present itself as an issue as well. And then family composition. A lot of people, at least at one point in time or another, live with extended family members, whether that's a grandparent, aunt, an uncle, cousins. So trying to figure out how exactly this, the family fits together can pose for a challenge sometimes, especially if people aren't necessarily listed on the census, their relationships aren't listed to each other, um, or if they're listed as an adopted son when they're also a nephew or a grandchild. So sometimes we miss some of those connections um, when we're looking at these documents. However, they are surmountable challenges, but they are things that many of us face when we're going on our family history journeys. Here we have a picture, uh, a map of common migration corridors for the Great Migration. This isn't the only way, places that people immigrated to. We like to be clear about that, but they're common arteries for the Great Migration. This is really helpful for us when we're doing family history research, the Great Migration. Um, impacts how we look for our families because many of our families left the South and lived somewhere else. And if we know where in the North that they lived, we can sometimes figure out where in the South they may have been from. There's ways to do that on the census, which we can talk about, which we will talk about later on. But this map also gives us a helpful general idea. And it's helpful when you're getting into doing genealogy research, if you're talking to other people about it, um, to know these, these arteries and these ways that people traveled. So we use online databases to get started with our family history research. They're an extremely convenient and helpful part and tool um, to have in your, in your toolbox. So we have three listed here, MyHeritage, Ancestry, and FamilySearch. Um, Ancestry is one of the more common ones that many people use, um, but we recommend using a variety of databases because you can find some things in one that you can't find in the other. Um, so that's a tip that we have. 
Ancestry also, we know as, as a subscription service, um, but right now you should definitely check your local public library. Many public libraries are um, allowing users to access Ancestry Library Edition from home for free with your library card. So definitely take a look. FamilySearch is also a free database that we recommend using um, because it does have so many documents in it, as well as research pages for many counties in the country that can give you a brief overview of the, the sources that are there for that county. It's a really, really helpful resource, especially once you get down to the local, you're searching in a specific county, um, perhaps in the south, um, and can give you an overview of what you can expect to find and where to write for those, or where to email or where to look for different documents. So databases are a really important tool, especially when we're getting started tracing our family tree. As you get further in, you'll also have to go into local history research and primary source documents, maybe from a courthouse, um, historical society. So keep that in mind as we continue. So there are many records that are helpful for doing genealogy and family history research. Um, many of these records are available through these databases. Um, the most common ones that you'll see there are the federal census, um, starting, maybe I should say ending with the 1940 census for now, that's the most recent census we have access to, though in less than a year, on April 1st, 2022, we will have access to the 1950 census, we are all very excited. Um, the census has a 72 year privacy hold that allows it, um, allows people's identifying information to be kept private, which is appropriate, for 72 years after it's taken, so once that 72 year mark is hit, it is completely a free-for-all for what you can see in the census. So we're excited. Um, we hope you are too. Um, so anyway, that's one of the largest document collections that is very, very helpful for finding our families. The census is taken every 10 years and it has been taken since 1790. Um, and it gives us a snapshot of the family, the household, um, who's there, where they live, who their neighbors are, as well as the quite answers to the questions the census taker asked, like birthplace, um, relationship to head of household, um, how many children do you have, a lot of things get in there. So they, the census is a really important document for this research and can tell us a lot about our families. Um, military records are another important place to look, especially the World War I and World War II draft cards. Um, many men registered for the draft at that time were required to. And so you do get a lot of information from those cards as well. You get birth dates, places where they lived, names of employers, names of next of kin. So those are another resource that are helpful in guiding you in the right direction. Vital records like birth, marriage, and death certificates um, can also be extremely helpful. They're, they're pretty common in the databases. Um, birth and death records weren't kept uniformly in most places until the early 20th century. So that can be frustrating the further you go back, but marriage records have been kept a very long time. Um, and on some of the records, and especially into the 20th century, they often, and earlier sometimes too, they often identify the names of the parents on those records. So that's another helpful, um, helpful clue and hint in your, in your process. Um, and then Family Search and Ancestry do have select international records. Um, they're not as full collections as the United States records are, but they are there. And depending on where you're looking, they can be a helpful resource, of course, um, depending on the language that is spoken in that country and depending on the language that you speak, that can be a barrier, but the records are there depending on the country's relationship with Ancestry and Family Search. So when we're starting our research, we recommend thinking like a genealogist. Um, being a genealogist is kind of like being a history detective. It's pretty fun and it does require um, a certain thought process to go through when you're doing this work. So we want you to be aware of computer errors. Computers are not pe perfect, neither are people, um, but there are errors in handwriting that can get um, messed up in the computer in the transcription process. Um, so we like to make sure that people look at the documents. You can pull up often in these databases a picture of the actual document as well as the transcription. So we always want to make sure those things match. Um, we want to make sure that you have it in your mind that people are more than a name. They could be re recorded with different names and spellings um, and that there are more things about them than just the name. 
Um, so don't, we don't want you to miss out on a clue because you're stuck on this one part. We like to say to make it make sense. Um, you recognized a name, um, but again, like in more than name, do the other, does the other info match on the record? There are many people named, um, you know, John Smith, Mary Smith, Joe Jones. Um, and just because that person matches your family member's name doesn't mean it's the exact right person. So you have to make sure that the record is in the right time period and you have to make sure that the other information matches. So we can get into big trouble when we start trying to connect people that aren't necessarily matches, but based on name um, with people in our family tree. And so we wanna make sure that we don't do that and that we use all of the clues that we have to make sure everything lines up or at least that most, thing, most things line up. Um, and then we also always want to make sure that you keep in mind to use the fan club. Um, families, associates, and neighbors are really important resources when we're doing this research. We can't always find a record about the exact person that we're looking for, but there, our family members often have brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles that may lead us in the right direction and can give us clues about the family member themselves. So if you're stuck in a rut, definitely make sure to keep the fan club in mind. And we always recommend when you have a census record, looking at the people who your family is living next to in each of those censuses. Oftentimes, especially in the earlier census records, 1870, 1880, even into 1900, people are still living close to their family members. And you can find out a lot about the community and who's around um, just by reading that census. So we definitely recommend doing that. So our major goals in African-American genealogy um, our, our sort of first big goal is tracing and tracing the our own ancestry to what we call freedom's first generation, the 1870 census. The people born around that time were the first to be born not into slavery um, on, a, on a larger scale. Of course, there were free black communities as well, but um, on a larger scale, the 1870 census is the first census where we see most African Americans listed for the first time. So we want to get to that census. This is kind of a benchmark for African American genealogy. Then we often hit something called the 1870 brick wall. So that's our next step is to scale or knock down or cut a hole in the 1870 brick wall. Um, and that's identifying enslaved ancestors and their communities. And that is possible. It is more challenging. You have to rely on, go outside of the, database, the databases more often, um, but it is very, very possible. And if you want more information on that, we're happy to answer in questions in question and answer time. Um, and then tracing our free ancestors and their communities is another important goal. Um, about 10% of African Americans were free at any given time. Um, during the antebellum period, um, roughly, and some of them are recorded in the census, and those are also communities that are important to trace. Um, often there is some research, some local history done about those communities, so plugging in and getting information about that is another one of our goals for African American genealogy. So to get started tracing your tree, you have all of this information that we just gave you, um, but the practical first steps are going to be to start with someone born between 1940 and 1901. So someone in the silent or in the greatest generation, um, one of your family members or whoever you're searching for, um, and then identifying them in a public record using whatever database is most comfortable for you. Um, and then you're gonna use the record that you identify about them in the records, as well as that information you may know about this person from your own family's oral history um, to search for people in earlier generations. So you build upon the clues that you have, and Lisa's gonna demonstrate this in just a moment in our case study, um, to continue to go back further in time. Thank you, Hannah. And so now that Hannah has outlined what the basic steps are in tracing your family tree, we're going to share this case study of the Northern family. Um, in the course of this, we're going to cover like four generations. We're going to start with Robert. We're going to cover his parents and grandparents, and then finally his great grandparents, Solomon Northern and Martha Wilson. The reason we're sharing this particular case study is because the family, we, the family had so many records. It was really an exceptional number of records that we found. We were able to get back to the 1870 census with them. We then found uh, Civil War era records on them as well. And then we think we've 
possibly identify an enslaver or slave owner for that family as well. So Robert Northern was one of our typical guests to the Family History Center who came. He was there actually one, one morning for one of our individual sessions. And we found out he was at the time a radio host of a local jazz program called The Collectors on the local radio station WPFW in Washington, DC. And I later found out that he was also a classically uh, trained uh, French horn player who had spent though most of his life as a jazz musician. So, you know, he's one of these jazz musicians where if you know jazz, you would know Robert Northern. He's also known as Brother Ah. He has played with uh, uh, luminaries like Miles Davis and Sun Ra and Thelonious Monk. And he also taught music at Brown University and I believe Dartmouth as well. So he has this illustrious career. And so when we started with him with the 1940 census, and if we go to the next excellent slide, we're gonna find him on the 1940 census. Now based on his birth, being born around 1934, we can start with him, as, as Hannah had said, with the 1940 census. And when we did that, I'm gonna start looking, um, I'm gonna start with uh, describing the, um, the census record on the right-hand side. We're gonna see the family, um, and it identifies who his parents are, Ralph Northern, and his mother is listed as Marie Northern. Her real name is actually Maddie. This is a digitized record, so as Hannah mentioned, you may find a lot of spelling errors. So we're gonna soon find out his mother's name is actually Maddie. And at that time, he also had brothers and sisters, Barbara, Ralph. So we see now a second Ralph, the father Ralph and a son Ralph, and also a little brother Gilbert. Um, to get back further, we're going to want to follow, we're gonna to wanna to track his father's family as we pick the Northerns. So if we look on the left-hand side, we're gonna get the personal information of his father. Some of the most important facts on that would be his birth year. He's born around 1906 in Virginia at the time he's married. Again, the family's living in the Bronx on Dawson Street. And if we go down, we'll see that he's working for the WPA project. That was one of the largest federal government projects during the depression. It employed a lot of people in all kinds of different capacities. And he happened to be employed as a laborer on a highway project. So again, if you select anyone on the census, you can also pull up not just their family information, but their individual information as well. And so again, if we think of Robert, he's born around 1935, 1934. 1940 is the only census record he's gonna show up on. And so in order to go back, we're going to have to pick either his mother or father. So we're going to pick his father, Ralph. And let's look at the next record. This is the actual census record, folks. Now, um, we also see again that his parents are from the South. And in looking at the individual record underneath, right, it's a huge record. It has 33 columns of, of information. So we always tell people when you get ahead, take your time and glean as much information from each record as you can. Um, and again, you also want to scan to see, as Hannah said, if you see any people with the same last name, you may have cousins or relatives living next door. You may want to go back a couple pages and forward a couple pages if you know you had other family members living in the same community. And if we go on to the next slide, it will give us clues about the migration story of the family. So since his parents, we know, were born in the South, what were their reasons for coming to the North? Unfortunately, um, Robert Northern died last year, almost a year ago, in 2020. And so this was the obituary that appeared for him in the Washington Post. And I'm going to read it briefly that he was born in 1934 in Kinston, North Carolina. He did not stay there long. His African-American father bested a Klansman in a fist fight. And my father's friends took him right from that spot to the railroad and sent him to Harlem, got him out of there, and we all left. So this was recounted in the oral history 
from the Open Sky Jazz website that appeared in his obituary in the post. So again, with these migration stories, we always want to know what was the reason for your family moving at that time? You know, there could have been several reasons. People move for employment, they move to join their family, they move for education. And in this case, it was an urgent move. And as he indicates, it possibly could have been because of the clan. So we always encourage people to find out what's the reasons for their uh, family's migration story. Your migration story also may involve what we call a chain migration, which means that they didn't just go from point A to point B. They may have stopped somewhere along the line. When I looked at my own family history, I thought that my family went from North Carolina straight to New Jersey. That's not what happened. My grandfather actually went from North Carolina to Philly for a little while, staying with his older brother. And then from Philly, he went to Northern Jersey. So it's always interesting to research the history behind these migration stories. As we look onto the next record, we're going to find them on the 1930 census. Again, we're going back. We want to eventually work our way back to 1870. In 1930, we're finding Robert's parents living in an extended family household. Now we find Ralph's parents, Robert and Bessie, and Ralph's other uh, siblings as well, Robert and Chauncey, Joseph and Ida, whose name is actually Mary Ida. Joseph's name may appear as Joseph James and then a sister, Bessie. Sarah is actually the wife of one of Ralph's sisters. And then of course we have Ralph highlighted in blue, Maddie, who Ralph and Maddie, who are Robert's parents and then Robert's older siblings, Barbara and Ralph. So again, when we find the family in 1930, they're living in an extended family household, and this time they're in Harlem. So before they got to the Bronx, they were living on 118th Street in Harlem. Now, the 1920 and 1910 census record aren't very different, but what's important is we're showing you the slide for the 1910 record. The 1920 record is, is very similar, and the 1920 record actually identifies them also living in Elizabeth City at 118 um, Union Street, which is the area near Hampton. What is interesting though about this record is it lists Robert and Bessie who are Ralph's parents, that's that next generation and their children. But the most important information on this record folks is that last entry. It's a little bit hard to see, but the last entry under this household is Martha Rhodes. She's identified as the 60 year old widowed mother of Robert living with the family. So if we follow Martha and continue to follow her back, that will lead us to more information regarding the Northern family, right? We also need to make a note that she has a different last name than her son. So that poses another question. Could she possibly be a remarried widow? We don't know, so we'll have to find that out. When we look at the 1891 uh, Civil War pension record, we, find, we finally find the name of um, Martha's husband, Solomon Northern. And this identifies that he served as a Civil War soldier in the Navy. And this was an actual remarried widow's pension record. So in 1891, Martha applied for pension money for her husband or uh, for her husband's service uh, through the federal government. And that information now gives us information on Solomon Northern on her husband. When we go back to 1880, this is, this is a jump because the 1890 census was mostly burnt up in a fire. This can sometimes create a brick wall because it, it means that we have to go back from the 1900 census to the 1880 census. And thankfully we were able to do that in the case of this family. 
when we did that, we find Martha is already a widow at age 35, living again in Hampton, Virginia, which is, which is called Elizabeth City at that time. They're living on a different street uh, on Mallory Avenue. And with her in that household is her 75-year-old mother, a widow, Charlotte Boyd. We want to pay attention to that name as we discover more records. He also has two sons, Abraham, who's listed as 15, and then Robert, who is our Robert's grandfather, as a five-year-old. So again, she is working as a farm laborer, um, and she's the head of household. The other thing to note about the 1880 record is um, it is the first census record to identify everyone in relationship to the head of household. So it will actually list family relationships. The census records that appear before 1880 list names, but they don't list how the people are actually related. So a typical census record will list the head of household and then everyone else in that head of household as they're related to that person. So in this case, it listed her, her mother, and then her children. When we went back to the 1870 record, now we find Solomon as the head of household. And it doesn't give us the relations, but we already know that Martha is his wife. We've identified Abraham on the 1880 census. And here we actually find out that he's named Abraham Lincoln after the president. He was actually born during the last year of President Lincoln's presidency. And there's someone by the name of Christian Hughes who has the same occupation as Solomon Northern, who's an oysterman. What we don't know though is, is Christian Hughes just a boarder paying rent, living with that household, or could he actually be a relative? So we would need to research that if we were interested in pursuing that and possibly conducting some oral history with the family to find out was Christian Hughes just a boarder or was he actual, an actual relative living with Solomon and Martha? When we get to this 1870 census, for many, it becomes like a fork in the road. If we don't continue to find them on the census, it would have meant for the most part that your African-American family would have been enslaved during slavery. And then we would start trying to use the slave schedule. We're gonna start looking at Freedmen's Bureau records and possibly Freedman's bank records. And so as we continue to look, we were fortunate in this case. And what we found was a marriage record for Solomon and Martha Northern. Um, marriage records, like typical vital records, were not uniform across the whole United States till the early 1900s. So if you find a marriage record on your family, particularly for African-American families, just three years after slavery, this is certainly an exceptional record. And if we look at Martha's side of the record on the right-hand side, we find that she is already widowed at age 24, which is interesting. She said she was born in Gates County. That is a bordering county from Virginia on North Carolina. So again, it's kind of that Northern North Carolina, Southern Virginia area, Hampton Roads area, that's the area that she's from. But it also lists her parents. And who do we see? We see Davy Boyd and Lottie Boyd, right? So if we think back to that 1880 census, her mother was listed as Charlotte. Here she's being referred to as Lottie. Okay, same person with the last name Boyd. Now, if we look at Solomon's information on the left-hand side, we're gonna find him, um, he says he's also widowed and he's only age 26. He says he's from Lancaster County. That's part of the Northern Neck of Virginia. I'll be going into detail about that in a couple seconds. And it also identifies his parents as Davy Cyani and Nancy Cyani. Now again, folks, we're looking at the digitized record. That last name, Cyani, is a little odd. So again, we may be looking at some kind of spelling error. We definitely want to get, we want to obtain his original marriage record to make sure we have the right last names. We also want to make note that though, his parents have a different last name from Solomon Northern. 
So I'm thinking, could it be a possibility that they were owned by different slave owners? That's something to think about as well, all right? And then as we continue to look for them, we found this next record, which was a Civil War index, giving us more information about Solomon. It indicates that now he's saying he's born in Oak Grove, Virginia. What's, what's, where's Oak Grove, Virginia? That is on the northern neck of Virginia, not far from Lancaster County. It's actually Westmoreland County. So it's virtually the same area of the northern neck. Um, he enlisted in the Navy in 1861. He served as a contraband aboard the vessel, the Charles Phelps. So as a contraband, we know that he's one of many thousands of African-American enslaved people who left the plantations during the era of the Civil War. They were following the Union troops over to their forts. And in the Hampton Roads area, we have Fort Monroe, which was one of the largest contraband camps during the Civil War. And so he took refuge not only at Fort, at Fort Monroe, but he also signed up and served aboard the Charles Phelps as a Civil War soldier. And again, we talked about two records, one indicating that he was born in Westmoreland County, another that he was born in Lancaster County. So what you're looking at is a map of the Northern Neck. It's a peninsula in Eastern um, Virginia. It's made up of about five counties. My family happens to be from Richmond County and Northumberland County. So when you find records on these on these families living particularly on the, on the peninsula, I always tell people keep an open mind because you may find family members identifying records across various counties all along the peninsula, not just in one county. And again, for uh, Solomon Northern, he's identifying um, possible records for his family in Westmoreland County and Lancaster County. Now we want to see if we can find him using a slave schedule. And as we go to the next record, this is a typical slave schedule. This one is for 1850. What is listed on a slave schedule? There are two, one for 1860 and 1850. So the uh, categories for the slave schedules, it identifies the slave owner or the enslaver. And then right next to that person's name starts the name of the first enslaved person, and then it continues in the list. The name of the enslaved person for the most part is not listed, but what is identified is the age of the person, the sex of the person, the color. Their color is usually listed as either beef or black or inframulato. There's also a column noting fugitives from the state. Did this person actually escape? There's also a column noting was this person manumitted or did this slave owner manumit any of the slaves? And then the final column is a disability column that identifies people either as deaf, dumb, blind, insane, or idiotic. That was a terminology used at that time. And if you look at other censuses, you're going to find the same terminology used. I do want to point out though, right now we know there, is, there are at least four counties that were exceptions to the 1850 and 1860 slave schedule. And when I say exceptions, those counties, Boyd County, Camden County, and Scott County, uh, they actually listed the names of the enslaved on the slave schedule. But again, the census taker was not supposed to list the names of the enslaved. He was just supposed to include what their stats were. But again, if you happen to have any family from those counties, you may actually find their names. And so when we use the slave schedule and when we plug the Northern last name into the state of Virginia, this is what we got. On the 1850 slave schedule for Westmoreland County, which he said he was, he said he was born in Oak Road, which is Westmoreland County, we found there was only one Northern slave holder. The person's name was John uh, H. Northern, and what you see before you is the list of his slaves. And when we think about the dates that were given for Solomon Northern's birth year, if we average them, he was likely somewhere between the ages of 25 and 30. 
when we look on the slave schedule list for John Northern, what do we find? We find at least two male slaves, one 25 year old and one 30 year old. So this may be, this is certainly a, a huge possibility of being a potential slave owner of Solomon Northern and for the Northern slave family. And again, at this point, what we wanna do is go to the courthouse. We wanna look at his property records, his inventory records, if he had any court cases, and we wanna start researching his family. You wanna research his family using family history information, conducting regular searches on the census, and, um, and obviously researching local history as well. We also encourage people, you always wanna go beyond the, 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 the databases. So we talked about uh, conducting oral history. You wanna see in terms of heirlooms and objects, see if you have any family Bibles in your family. They can help identify marriage information and birth years and birth dates, as well as death dates. Did your family have any social and religious affiliations? What churches did they attend? Did they belong to any Masonic organizations? In the last 10 years, there's a lot more Masonic information that's, me that's being made available. Uh, so you'll certainly want to look into that information. Do you know what cemeteries your family was uh, were, were buried in. And this becomes a really critical question because it gets kind of dicey when you look at families who have migrated, right? If your family was in Mississippi and they migrated to Chicago, then it's gonna require you to look at cemeteries across states, right? So, but that's such important information to look for as well as continuing to research local and state history looking at state archives to find out what kind of information you can find out and going to those county historical societies. You also may want to consider DNA testing as well. And that's all that we have for today. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. And we look forward to talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, for joining us, uh, Lisa and Hannah. I believe we do have quite a few questions in the chat. Yeah, um, and, and I, I have those. Um, a question was asked, will these slides be available? The slides won't be available, but we can send information and have, the, um, have a conversation or a session with you all. Um, and we're also happy to send a condensed version of the information that we have in the slides. And then this is also being recorded. So um, as the Mark Walker Center said, it'll be sent out to people who registered after this is over. Okay. Please say more about the 72 year privacy hold on census data. So, so the 72 year census, it's, it's the, the 72 year hold is for privacy reasons. It actually started around World War II when the 1870 census was, what was released. It started as a practice to keep a hold of 72 years before someone can actually access the individual information, right? When it comes to the census, folks, we always know the population and we always know major demographics for housing, for education, so forth and so on but you can't access someone's individual information for 72 years. In the 1970s, there was an actual lawsuit to keep it, to keep that access for 72 years or to keep that hold for 72 years. So now it's actually legally binding and unless the federal law changes, you can't access that information for 72 years. And as Hannah stated, um, we're coming upon a new year next year, 19, uh, 2022. We uh, the federal government or the Census Bureau will release the 1950 census. But let me also say this, there is one exception. If for some dire reason, you do need to look at a census record within that 72 year gap, you can apply for a special application to the federal government 
to, you know, but again, you'll have to come up with some really good reason of why you need to see that information beforehand. But there is a process to do that. Okay. Another question was, are there resources or strategies for finding out more about towns and cities listed on a census that may no longer exist? That's a great question. Um, what we would recommend you do is look and see what county that town was in um, and do research on the county as well as towns that are nearby other towns in that county and get in touch with the county historical society or if there's a historical society for a neighboring town um, and re use those resources to learn more about the town that existed once and maybe does not anymore. Um, so using the surrounding area and the county that um, will likely have information on all the towns that exist or no longer exist. And that, okay. yeah, I, and I just want to add one more. Yeah, and yeah. You kind of said, yeah. Um, there's also the enumeration maps. If you, when you're doing your county research, you want to know what counties came from what counties. So you you definitely want want to, you want to maybe look at gazetteers, which will tell you the history of counties, what, what town names changed or how they became part of a city and how all that evolved over time. You want to look up your local gazetteers and you want to find out what counties came from what counties. And again, if you, and you know, when you just conduct a simple Google search, it will let you know if, you know, given county A came from given county B. Okay, and I just wanted to mention that um, Jan Hilligus, who is a dedicated researcher at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, has given detailed answers to a number of these questions that particularly relate to Mississippi. For example, for this question, she said there is a hometown Mississippi book at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, as well as subject files, WPA county histories, family maps and books for many counties and old maps that can help you find, uh, particularly at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, information about no longer existing communities. Yeah, and your, your Mississippi State Archives uh, website has really good record collections on, on, on African American history, including the Freedmen's Bureau, which is really neat. Another question was, how important is the date of birth when searching census records? The date of birth is pretty variable, honestly, when you're searching census records. Um, I have not had a relative that has the exact same birth year the entire time, like in each from census to census. Um, they're typically off by a couple of years, but I have a, a great great grandfather who was the same age in two censuses so <laughs> that shows you that that's a, a 10 year difference and it was the same person wow. everything else is the same I, I'm sh like 100% sure it's the same person um, but yeah so the ages can vary um, as much as 10 years pretty much more than that that's a little questionable but um, so the exact date is, it's important to have a ballpark is I guess what we tell people is if you can get, if it's, you're searching for someone and you don't know their actual birth year, the best you can estimate is gonna be good enough. And a lot of the databases will um, give you, if you're looking at Ancestry, they'll just kind of give you everything. They don't pay that close attention to what you put in the, the box, it feels like. Um, but then if you're looking at family search, you can put in a birth year range and you can put in a, a good chunk of dates that you think will encompass several birth years for the person that you're looking for. Um, and we tell people to don't get, don't get too hung up on birth years when you're using the census um, because of this variation that you can see. Okay. And there was a question as to exactly what does contraband, the word contraband mean? You use the term contraband. Yeah, so contraband was the term given to um, slaves who were literally walking off the plantations, following the Union forces over to their forts and, and seeking refuge. The first large group of slaves to do that were in the Hampton area, and they ended up at Fort Monroe, which is in the Hampton Phoebus area, and they were literally given that term contraband. 
And so that just became the, 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 the general term given to those people. Do you have any, anything else to add to that, Hannah, regarding the term contraband? No, I guess um, I can, it's, it's, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was gonna say it's, it's an interesting term, right? Because um, it still uh, references African-Americans as property um, and makes a sort of a reference towards that. Um, if they're being called contraband by the Union Army and the people that are um, helping to fight a war against slavery. So it's, it's a, an interesting term um, and an interesting concept, I guess, uh, when you think about the context that it was used in. And again, Jan Hillegas has put a detailed definition of contraband in the chat. So check out what she has in the chat about the word contraband. One other thing, you may, also, you may also want to look up the Fort Monroe um, in Hampton, Virginia. Again, it was the site of the largest contraband camp. And that site will give you a really good history about that, that whole era at that time and who the contraband were. And it has some neat photos, on, uh, some neat illustrations uh, on that, uh, from that time period as well. Okay. I and actually... Oh, sorry, Angela. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I had a, a couple of questions as well. Um, one being more on the practical side for someone who's already sort of started using one of these online databases. Do you have any tips for how to kind of congregate the information you find from multiple databases? Um, I, genealogy organization across databases and with you just, you know, all the documents that you're getting is really something that we should talk about more <laughs> in our presentations um, because it can be overwhelming and there can be a lot of information. Some people start family trees on both websites. Um, I've started to tell people and something that I think is helpful is to come up with an organiza organizational system for yourself um, outside of the databases um, and download, you can download the actual pictures of the documents from both sites to, you can save them as an image and download them to your computer um, or, you know, download them and send it to yourself if you're using a computer elsewhere. Um, uh, so I've been recommending that people find a system that works for them about and, and organizing their records that way. Um, again, like I said, it's, it's hard to make them talk to each other unless you have a software, which I don't have and haven't used in a long time, like Family Tree Maker. Um, and some people have to go that route. Um, but I've been telling people if you have um, like Google and you use Google Drive, you making um, folders for each person in your family and also keeping a, a list in each folder for your, your people in your family about questions that you have, a little biography of them from what you know of them already, um, as well as like what's your next step on that person if you've hit a brick wall with them um, or you know, anything else that you find out or any questions that come up in your research is a way to keep track and is a way to organize your own note taking. Um, because though the databases are great and offer great options for creating family trees and saving that information, there are places, unless you're using it to the fullest extent, which I don't, most people don't, I don't know. Um, there are places where it can get lost and they're not always the most user friendly or the ways that most people want to use them. So I always, I've been recommending more recently that people come up with their own ways to keep track. I know Lisa also has talked about Evernote. Um, that's um, like a note taking software that you can download um, and use that to organize your genealogy records as well. And I know Lisa has some resources for organization too. Um, I think you kind of covered everything. The only other thing, I mean, I'm, I'm an old school person. I've been doing genealogy for a while and I'm still, you know, make a print copy of it. Make sure you have it in that binder. You certainly want all, all your digital versions and to do your digital family tree so you can share it with people. But, you know, when you're doing family research, think about uh, intergenerations and, you know, you want to share it with your great uncle or whomever. And I, I just became a great aunt, you know what I'm saying? So think across the generations and be open to both digital and paper, you know, digital and paper. You know. 
Thanks. That's very helpful. Um, I do also have another question. Um, and this is just more out of curiosity, but have you seen any end results of this type of family research? Like, how do people put all the information they gather sort of to good use? Um, you mentioned like printing out these hard documents to be able to share with family, but I wonder if there are any other examples you've seen. The, some of the examples I've seen, um, one of my favorite examples is, you know, just is, is writing a book. It doesn't have to be anything long. Um, there's a lady out of Frederick, and there, there, there's many examples. She just, she compiled a nice scrapbook uh, using family photos, family documents, and she just wrote short chapters per generation. And she put it all together, and it's just a nice, simple table, uh, like, what do you call it, coffee table book, you know? People also, I've seen them, you know, cr create their own websites. And then a third thing um, would be to even like share your family tree on one of what, like using a, a, a display board that, you know, you might, you know, that you can take to family reunions and you can take, you know, to your, if, if, if you're visiting other family members, but that will help share some of the family history. Oh, okay. And you have to I had just a few things extra that had come up. Um, do you recommend family tree software? It really depends on what you're going to find useful. Um, I don't use family tree software personally. I, ha I, I do use Ancestry and I've also started um, to organize using uh, Google Docs, um, Google Drive. And so those are ways that I've been keeping track of my, my, um, family history and family tree. Um, I, my former job, I used family tree maker pretty regularly. And for me, to me, it felt like it added another step doing the same thing that I was already doing on Ancestry and it wasn't the most user friendly for me. So that's my opinion. I think it's really personal, whatever you are most comfortable with. If, if a, a family tree software maker works for you, then that's awesome. And you are able to take advantage of all of the things that it has to offer. Um, that wasn't really the case for me, so <laughs> I came up with my own system, and that works just as fine. <laughs> and I don't know, Lisa, what do you think? I just, um, yeah, no, that, that's fine. I, again, I'm a paper person. I do have some of my family tree online, and then I am just putting it together in a binder. Um, and the, the family tree maker, um, I, I know that, how can I say, many of my colleagues who've been doing genealogy for a long time still, still use it, but all of the folks doing genealogy now are kind of taking Han, Hannah's method. So it, it just really depends on what you're comfortable with. Okay, and I just wanted to point out in the chat, it states, GenoPro is a software application for drawing family trees in mm -hmm. genograms. Okay. And someone mentioned, I think this is the same person, that their family has created a family reunion book where they include the family history for everyone to access. Mm -hmm. And I would just want to mention that as an archivist, I always stress lots of copies. So definitely having a print version as well as <laughs> electronic copies in this day and age, whether they be um, on the cloud or on some uh, yeah. software, it is good to have it in multiple formats. But I would also stress try and capturing voices of family members because um, I mean, one of the most precious things I have is a oral history with my mom talking about what it was like for her growing up so, to, so that future generations could not only read but also see and hear. Um, family members is as important as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, as an oral historian, I completely agree with that, Ms. Stewart. Um, I actually just did oral history interviews with my grandmother and grandfather in North Carolina. Um, had to record them separately because they like to contradict each other at any possible opportunity. Um, so I had to contrive to interview one while the other was in the shower. But um, I'm so happy to have recorded their stories and to be able to have that for the future. 
Um, this it's been an hour, so we're about at the close of our programming. I just wanted to thank Lisa and Hannah again for joining us and for giving us all of this really great information. Um, as we said earlier, the whole hour has been recorded and will be made available to all of our registered participants. Um, and as Hannah mentioned, they will be happy to send along um, some of the consolidated information that they've shared. And obviously, anyone is welcome to sign up for a session with them in order to delve into their own personal family histories. Thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Great, thank you. Thank um, you. We can stay on a, a minute or two if anyone has any last final questions. Um, otherwise, thank you all, uh, everyone who attended. We really did appreciate having you with us this yeah. afternoon. And we look forward to seeing what your family trees look like once you get started. I have just one question. Um, the recording, will that be sent to us automatically or do we need to request that? Um, you can go ahead and send me an email. And this way we can make sure that you definitely want a copy of the recording. We haven't decided just yet how we're going to go about distributing it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I want, it's, I'm Angela Stewart, I'm the archivist here at the Margaret Walker Center, and I want to thank everyone for attending as well. In particular, I see some church members <laughs> who, who made it here today, and I'm so glad to see, as well as family, friends, and Margaret Walker Center board members. So, so we're just glad to have everyone, and including former Margaret Walker Center employees. <laughs> we're so glad to have you all here with us today. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again. We'll be logging off. Take care and happy Earth Day. Yes. Oh thank my you. goodness, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.